Um, we have two talks today. Uh, first is by Matthias Taudacher from ETH Zurich, and another by Mark Meze from uh, Simon Center for Geometry and Physics. Uh, I want um, to introduce Matthias. Samson, be yeah. better correct the name of the speaker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not tall enough. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Matthias Gabardil from. But it's, uh, it's N equals to four, so what's yeah. the Sorry, Matthias. <laughs> Look, happens, life. So Matthias Gabriel actually um, is from Switzerland, from ETH Zurich, and he kindly agreed to give a lecture. Uh, he, he, he doesn't need introduction, uh, but let me say just one, one word that connects me with Matthias, which is that his advisor, Peter Goddard, uh, and uh, Hamilton was much since it's where I, I, I am connected. He was the founding uh, member of the board of the Hamilton Mathematics Institute, and Matthias uh, defended PhD under supervision of Peter Goddard. So I found connection. <laughs> but I thought it'd be two. Uh, and of course, Matthias has been working on, on so many things, uh, uh, mostly related to actual deep mathematical structures of string theory and conformal field theory, and his talk today, I'm sure, will be one of those. Please. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, work I've been doing um, uh, mainly with Rajesh Kopaguma, and it's really a, a series of works, and I'll try to explain to you um, where we believe we've got to now. So our aim is to understand the ADS-CFT correspondence. And, uh, I assume you know roughly speaking what the ADS-CFT correspondence is, but what's important is to understand how the parameters of the two sides are related to one another in order to understand where and how one has a chance to prove it. So the, the, the parameters of the ADS side, say the radius of the ADS space, in terms of Planck units, is related to the rank of the gauge group N, and the radius in string units is related to the uh, tooth parameter of the, of the gauge theory. So what we'll mainly have in mind is to be at large n, um, which is sort of believed to be the, the planar limit of the n equals to four superhang mills theory. And then we are, we are trying to find a regime where we have a chance of proving ADS-CFT. So obviously the most promising regime is that you try to be in a regime where the gauge theory is weakly coupled at large n, which means that the tooth parameter is small. And if you follow this dictionary, what this means is that the radius in string units has to be small. So this is a bizarre regime of string theory. That's the regime where the ADS space is basically as large as the typical size of the string, or put differently, the string is as large as the ADS space in which it propagates. So this is commonly called the tensionless limit of string theory because strings are very floppy, they're very large, so it's the opposite to the supergravity regime where the string is tightly bound and can be approximated by a point. So this is the wobbly, large, floppy string description of the world. Now, this is the regime where ADS-CFT has a chance to become perturbative. I mean, people often say ADS-CFT is a strong weak duality, and what they mean by that is that if you are in the weakly coupled super young mills regime, that corresponds to a regime that's very far from the supergravity regime of string theory. So from the point of view of supergravity, there's no chance of understanding this tensionless string. But what you could hope for is that because it's so special, it must have a lots of symmetries. It must have all the symmetries that characterize the weakly coupled super young mills theory. What you could hope for is that while it doesn't have a solvable supergravity description, it may have a solvable world sheet description. I, going back to string theory as a proper string theory as being described by a world sheet theory, you would expect that the special features of the free superhang mills theory should manifest itself by the fact that the world sheet description may become free or at least solvable. At least some special features should happen with the world sheet theory reflecting that you have a large amount of symmetry in this tensionless point, in this point where the superhang mills theory is weakly coupled. So this is our working hypothesis. This is our idea. And what I first want to explain to you is that we have very good evidence that this idea is at least true in principle. And the reason we are so confident that this idea is true in principle is that there is one example where we understand this extraordinarily well. And that's the case 
of the string duality involving string theory in ADS3, three-dimensional ADS space, times S3 times T4, being dual to the symmetric orbifold of T4. I mean, a more precise statement is that string theory on this background is dual to a conformal field theory that lives somewhere on the same moduli space as of conformal field theories that also contains the symmetric orbifold point. So what I mean by that is the symmetric orbifold point is a specific conformal field theory, a solvable, almost free conformal field theory, but it has exactly marginal operators, so you can deform it. So it's really part of a whole moduli space of conformal field theories. And the dual, the CFT dual of string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross T4 corresponds to some point somewhere in this moduli space. So, so this is sort of the collected wisdom about uh, ADS CFT for the three-dimensional case. And you can ask, what's the analog of free superhang mills in this three-dimensional context? Now, the natural idea is that the analog of free superhang mills is the symmetric orbifold theory itself. Because the symmetric orbifold theory is basically a free theory. It consists of 4n free bosons, 4n free fermions, modded out by some symmetry. But it basically behaves and looks like a free field theory. It's certainly exactly solvable. So you would expect that this is the moral analog of free superhang mills. So if you believe this sort of general picture, you would expect that it's dual to some tensionless string theory in ADS3. And that should mean it's in the very stringy, far from supergravity regime. So if you think about it from the point of view of what a world sheet description of this could look like, you would expect this to describe an ADS space that's very, very small relative to the string size. And if you look at, for example, the uh, way in which Berkowitz, Waffer, and Witten describe string theory in ADS3 cross S3, they describe it in terms of some wesomino witten model based on PSU 1, 1 slash 2 on the super Lie algebra. And you would expect that the tensionless point corresponds to the point where the level of this super Lie algebra is the smallest because the level is a measure for the size of the space. So what we propose, or what we notice, is that this theory has a free field realization in terms of symplectic bosons and free fermions, and I'll explain in more detail later what I exactly mean by that. And what we checked is that the world sheet theory described by these bosons and fermions reproduces exactly the spectrum of the symmetric orbifold theory itself. So this is an example where this world sheet theory produces exactly what the dual CFT looks like, at least on the level of the spectrum. And then subsequently, we also showed that the correlation functions of the dual CFT are correctly reproduced on the world sheet. So this is an example where this general idea that uh, free superhang mills, or the analog of free superhang mills, should be described by a free theory on the world sheet is realized in a very concrete setting. And I'll briefly review for you the highlights of this because that will be the working hypothesis that we want to generalize to ADS5. And so one, one key player here will be spectrally flowed representations, and I'll briefly explain what that means. Now, what we proposed uh, a few months ago is that there is a natural generalization for n equals to 4 superhang mills, and what we claim is that the string theory dual to free superhang mills in four dimensions has a world sheet description, again, in terms of free fields in terms of symplectic bosons and fermions. The only difference is that instead of having 4 plus 4, you now need 8 plus 8. So it'll be basically a doubled version of what we had for ADS3 cross S3. And again, the key ingredients are the spectrally flowed representations, and I'll explain to you how they arise. And then what I want to highlight, or what I want to explain to you, is that there is a very natural quantization of this world sheet theory, and if you follow it, then you produce exactly the spectrum of free superhang mills of n, n equals to 4 superhang mills in the planar limit. So our world sheet theory, our proposal for the world sheet theory, seems to reproduce at least the spectrum of n equals to 4 at the free point correctly. And that's obviously an important step towards believing that that is the correct description for this theory. Now, obviously, this is a very recent work. There are many, many open problems and questions which we haven't resolved. This is not a full story. The story for ADS3 is pretty complete. For ADS5, this is a proposal, but we are very confident that this is a promising proposal, and we believe that this is on the right track. And I'll try to explain to you why we believe that this may have all the right ingredients to work.
So the outline of my talk is that after this introduction and motivation, I'll briefly review to you what, uh, how the ADS3 story works, because that will be the, the, the role model we'll have in mind. And then I'll explain to you how it generalizes to ADS5, and then I'll conclude and uh, indicate what the important directions for the future are. OK, so ADS3, cross S3, is best described at this uh, level one. Uh, if you are studying the theory of pure Neverschwartz and Neverschwartz flux, as we do, in terms of this hybrid formalism, so this goes back to the work of Berkowitz, Waffer, and Witten, and what they proposed, or what they argued for, is that this string background is described in terms of this uh, super Lie algebra vesomino witten model at level k, together with a topologically twisted sigma model for the T4, and then they have some goals, and they have a cohomology to characterize the physical degrees of freedom. Now, this has been checked to agree with the other, maybe more familiar description of strings on ADS in terms of this Maldesino or Gori SL2 R Vesumino Witten model. But in any case, we'll just take this as the gospel and we'll just uh, work with this model and we'll work with this model at k equals to 1. k equals to 1 is the regime where it's sort of the smallest radius, so you would believe that has the best chance to correspond to tensionless strings. Now, what happens at k equals to 1 is that this theory has a free field realization. And it has a free field realization in terms of what one may call symplectic bosons, or if you may want to call them a beta gamma system of spin a half. So these are bosonic fields of spin a half, so they satisfy commutation relations, but the commutation relations look like spin a half fields. So that's why they're symplectic bosons. And you have uh, four real fermions, so they just satisfy the usual commutation relations of three fermions. And the idea is that the bilinears made out of the symplectic bosons and the real fermions generate the super Lie algebra u1, 1, 1 slash 2 at level 1. And then in order to get to p as u1, 1, 1 slash 2, which is the global symmetry of ADS3 cross S3, so this is where we want to go, you have to divide out by some diagonal u1, which is a certain linear combination of the different uh, symplectic bosons and real fermions. So, so this is just a fact of life that uh, this PSU 1, 1 slash 2 algebra at level 1 has such a free field realization. So now you want to understand the spectrum of this world sheet theory in terms of these free fields. And free fields representation theory is very simple. I mean, if you have, say, free fermions, then you have a Neve Schwartz sector where all the modes are half integer moded, and you have a Ramon sector where all the modes are integer moded, and typically you have some typical highest weight representations, or you have some ground states, and then you produce the Fox space where all the negative modes do their business and generate this full Fox space of states. And these are, in fact, the only highest weight representations you can have. You have to choose all the fields to be either Neve Schwartz or Ramon so that the bilinears are integer moded because your PSU symmetry should not be broken. So this is a caricature for what the Ramon sector representation looks like. It's infinite dimensional on the ground states because you can end up with an SL2R representation and that goes up and down. Or if you think of it in terms of the symplectic bosons, the symplectic boson zero modes will just uh, move you to the left and to the right and they will, they will not terminate anyway, at, at least not generically. So this is what the Ramon sector of this uh, symplectic boson uh, theory will look like. Now, these representations are not sufficient to describe string theory in ADS3 cross S3, and this was already realized a long time ago by Maldesino Oguri. Namely, you need uh, what they call the spectrally flowed representations. And the basic reason for that is if you think about solving string theory, then you have to impose the mass shell condition, L0 is equal to 1, say, but if your spectrum is bounded from below, then there will be only finitely many excitations that will be compatible with the mass shell condition. But that's clearly not what you want. Just like in freeze in flat space, in Minkowski flat space, your L0 spectrum must be unbounded from below so that the physical state condition still allows arbitrarily many oscillators. Now, in the case of ADS3, the correct prescription, according to Maldesino Oguri, is that you introduce these spectrally flowed representations. And what this means is that you start with your symplectic bosons, and you simply observe that they observe that they have a relatively obvious automorphism. Namely, you can shift the mode numbers up and down by W over 2, as long as those that are coupled together in commutators get shifted the opposite way. And now the idea is that you start with a regular, say, Ramon sector representation, and you think of this as a representation of these tilde modes, and then you simply interpret it 
in terms of the modes whose mode numbers have been shifted relative to those. More formally, what this really means is that there is an automorphism of this algebra, and you take a representation and you just uh, apply the automorphism first, and because the automorphism is outer, you will generically uh, generate a new representation, and that's the representation you generate. Now, this representation, because you see, for example, the tilde modes, the tilde zero modes don't kill, and as a consequence, the xi plus plus w half modes don't kill, and as a consequence, what you will have is the L0 spectrum will be unbounded from below because the further you go to the right, the lower the L0 eigenvalue will become. In fact, if you calculate the L0 generators, they'll be proportional to J3 till the 0, and therefore this is the Carton generator of the SL2, and therefore you get, uh, you get an unbounded spectrum with respect to the L0s. So that's the spectrum you have to do. What you do is you take this Ramon sector, you take the Ramon sector left and right, and then you spectrally flow it left and right by the same amount. You take the direct sum of that. That's the world sheet theory before you impose the physical state condition. And that's just translating what Maldesina or Guri did into this hybrid formalism. Now you have to impose the physical state condition, and here something very special happens that's very specific to level one. You see at level one, this has a free field realization in terms of four symplectic bosons and four fermions but you have to impose this U1 condition, this charge condition, and the U1 condition will remove two bosonic degrees worth, two, two, deg two bosonic uh, degrees of freedom worth, because you see, you will impose that the U1 positive modes will kill it, but then the negative U1 modes will be null states and will be quotiented out. It works exactly like you impose a Virasoro condition in string theory. So you lose two bosonic degrees of freedom from the U1 condition, and therefore you only got two bosonic degrees of freedom left from the ADS3 cos S3 part, but then the usual physical state condition of string theory will kill another two bosonic degrees of freedom, and what you end up realizing is that there are no degrees of freedom left from the ADS3 cos S3 sector. All the degrees of freedom come from the residual T4 sector, and if you count the states correctly, what you realize is that you get exactly the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold of T4. All the excitations from the ADS3 part, ADS3 cross S3 part, have disappeared, and this is a specific feature of this at being at level one. At level one, the theory is much smaller than at generic levels. This is similar to SU2 level one being equivalent to a single free boson. SU2 level K is really three-dimensional, but SU2 level one is one-dimensional. I has far fewer degrees of freedom, and here this is sort of the supergroup equivalent of that. So what we checked is that you reproduce on the nose the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold, where the W cycle twisted sector, for those people who are familiar with this, come from this W spectrally float sector on the world sheet. So this reproduces the spectrum, and then we also check that the correlators of the symmetric orbifold theory are reproduced correctly from this world sheet theory, and this is quite elegant how this works. So if you think about how you, what you should calculate on the world sheet is you should look at vertex operators that depend on some world sheet coordinate, but the, the corresponding state should be inserted somewhere in the dual CFT, so they will also depend on some coordinate x that tell you where you have inserted the state on the sphere on which the dual CFT lives. And when you calculate these correlation functions on the world sheet and you use the word identities that come from this free field description, what you realize is that these correlation functions are typically zero. In fact, they are delta function localized to those configurations where the z's and the xi's align themselves in such a way that the holomorphic covering map from the world sheet from the space where the z lives into the space where the x lives exists. And the holomorphic covering map is a map that near z equal to zi looks as such. And it's holomorphic everywhere, and these are the only critical points. So this is, a, uh, this is the Horvitz problem of finding uh, holomorphic covering maps. They are discrete, there are not many. And what you can prove is these correlation functions are delta function localized to those configurations that have such a covering map. And therefore, when you do the world sheet integral, as you are instructed to do in string theory, when you integrate out over all the moduli on your string world sheet theory, then this integral, the delta function, just makes this integral disappear, and you end up with a finite sum over all the possible covering maps. And what you end up with is uh, uh, the 
a set of covering maps, and that's one way of calculating the symmetric orbifold correlation functions. So in some sense, you manifestly reproduce the way you calculate orbifold, symmetric orbifold correlators from this world sheet perspective. So, so this is a theory where you really see that the spectrum agrees and that you see that the structure of the symmetric orbifold correlators is reproduced on the world sheet. And it's reproduced by this very intriguing manner in that it behaves effectively like a topological string theory in the sense that these integrals that are typically horrendously complicated to solve just simplify because of this delta function constraint and become summed over discrete covering maps and thereby reproduce manifestly what you expect. So this is the real success story. This is the success story where it works. And in fact, if you write this localization property in terms of the free fields, it looks very much like what you may recognize as being an incidence relation in twister space. So the xi plus and xi minus look like twister variables. And this looks like the, the incidence relation that would relate a twister space to the space time. So this suggests that maybe the correct way to think about this world sheet theory is that the degrees of freedom that live on it should be twister variables rather than the space-time variables themselves. So this is what motivated us to try to guess what the correct generalization to ADS5 is. You know what the twister space of ADS5 is. The twister space of ADS5 uh, looks uh, like the ambi-twister space for, for the four-dimensional space that's dual to it. And you can try to imitate this in terms of the world sheet degrees of freedom that you introduce. And when you imitate it, then what you, would be, what you are led to believe is that you should uh, in replace this uh, four symplectic bosons, four fermions, and the T4 by eight symplectic bosons and eight fermions. So this is, comes naturally from the point of view of the twister space, and I'll, I'll explain this on the next slide in more detail. The other evidence why this is maybe on the right track is that this, these free fields will generate the super Lie algebra U2,2 slash 4 at level 1, and U2,2 slash 4 is very closely related to P as U2,2 slash 4. In fact, you have, again, to divide out by an overall U1, and P as U2,2 slash 4 is the correct superconformal symmetry of n equals to 4 super mills. So the zero modes of this superconformal algebra on the world sheet will give you the global symmetries in target space, which is what you would expect how things should work out for this, uh, in, in, this, in this situation. So, so more concretely, what does this world sheet theory look like? So we have uh, symplectic bosons. We organize them in two pairs of two. So we have the lambdas and the mu daggers. They satisfy a symplectic boson commutation relation and the mu's and the lambda daggers. They carry each a spinner index. One carries a spinner index, an, an undotted, and the other one carries a dotted SU2 spinner index. And then we have four free fermions that sit in the fundamental representation and the anti-fundamental representation of SU4. And they just satisfy familiar fr uh, free fermion commutation relations. And in fact, the field content looks exactly like the old proposal of Berkowitz uh, for how to describe the twister string corresponding to ADS5 except his theory was somewhat different. Uh, I don't want to explain exactly in which way his theory differs, but he, didn't, he added some additional degrees of freedom. He didn't have spectrally flowed sectors, et cetera. But he also thought he was motivated by this theory because that are the correct twister degrees of freedom you would expect. From our perspective, it's more the natural generalization from ADS3, giving you the right super Lie algebra on MEP as you 2, 2 slash form. Now, how do you get to PSU 2, 2 slash 4? Well, you look at the bilinears. You take one generator from the Ys and one generator from the Zs, and then you check that they generate U2,2 slash 4 at level 1. And in order to obtain PSU 2, 2 slash 4, you have to divide out by some overall U1 field. That should sound somewhat familiar to you. And the overall U1 field in this context looks as such. And this is a construction which we checked from first principles. But in fact, this is just something that's very familiar in the spin chain community for the description of n equals to 4 super mills, because this is the oscillator construction of PSU 2, 2 slash 4 people use in this context. Well, the oscillator construction would give you the global algebra. Here we get the affine algebra. So this is the affinization of this oscillator construction that's very familiar in the spin chain community. Again, that makes you believe you're ticking another box relating it to something else that sort of roughly is in the right ballpark of things that should appear for this theory. Okay, so now 
I think the key new ingredient relative to what people had tried before is our idea that this spectral flow is something that should also happen for ADS5 because you see spectral flow gives you the W cycle twisted sector, so they should somehow give you the, the trace sectors with W fields in it. So our idea is that we take these fields and we also don't just have the usual free field realization, that would give you basically an empty spectrum, but that you add in these spectrally flowed representations, and the way you spectrally flow these fields, you, you learn your guess by analogy with ADS3. So in ADS3, the spectral flow direction was determined by the eigenvalue with respect to J30, which is the Cartan generator of SL2, or the conformal dimension in the dual CFT, and the R symmetry generator of the SU2 associated to the S3. So for SU5, ADS5, you should take the dilatation operator of n equals to 4, and you should take a certain R symmetry generator inside the SU4 of, uh, of n equals to 4. So that fixes for you what this spectral flow looks like, and as you see, half the fields go up and half the fields go down. It's a very, very democratic, and that's because they sit in commutators, so if one field mode number goes up, the corresponding one must go down. So now let's understand what these representations uh, look like. So uh, let's focus on this line. So mu tilde r uh, is equal to mu r plus w over 2, so before spectral flow, so in this case, it's convenient to let it act on the neve schwartz sector, but that's a really a minor technicality. So the mu tildes kill all the modes uh, r equals to a half and higher, will kill the neve schwartz sector vacuum. So this means that the mu's will kill the neve schwartz sector vacuum if r is equal to w plus 1 over 2. So you see that the mu modes and all the modes that are shifted upwards by W over 2 annihilate if the mode number is sufficiently big, and the other ones kill if the mode number is, again, sufficiently big, but uh, uh, greater or equal than minus W minus 1 over 2. So it is two minutes. Okay. Okay. So, so these are the modes that kill. So then, in a free field theory, everything that doesn't kill creates. So the things that create are therefore all the other modes, and then you can just organize them as such. And then our proposal is that, uh, so this is a, a postulate, this is something we haven't yet derived, but uh, what we propose is that there is a physical state condition that comes from an n equals to 4 critical string that will remove essentially all the modes that are sufficiently negative, and you leave only behind half the modes and only in this, in this wedge between minus w minus 1 and over 2 and w minus 1 over 2. This is something that's uh, more of a postulate than something we don't, can derive, but we believe that's a natural, uh, natural idea, and it also is somewhat supported by some of the former analysis of people trying to understand uh, flux backgrounds in this Berkowitz uh, string. Okay, if you take this at face value, so what we propose is you just take the Fox space, and in the W cycle twisted sector, in the uh, W spectral fluid sector, these are the modes that generate the Fox space, and then you still have to impose some residual gauge condition, then you have to impose the condition, this U1 condition, you still have to impose, and you have to impose some Maschel condition. So we postulate that these are the conditions you have to impose, and if you buy that, then we can show that the resulting spectrum reproduces exactly that of n equals to four super mills in the planar limit. So this is the, the, the key result that there are some gaps in modifying, uh, motivating why these are the right conditions, but if you do, you end up with something that reproduces exactly n equals to four super mills. And the argument is not that hard to see. You can think of them as being momentum modes associated to position modes. And this condition really means that you impose this U1 condition at every site. So you have the singleton condition at every site. And this gives rise to a cyclic invariance condition. So you end up with a W fold tensor product of the singleton representation modulo some cyclicity condition, and that exactly describes the spectrum of free n equals to four super mills. So in a picture, what, you, what, we, what we find is that the physical degrees of freedom that arise from this W spectrally flowed sector on the world sheet are exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with all the W letter words inside a single trace of n equals to 4, where inside these letters you pick any of the fields of n equals to 4, or its derivatives, which are exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with this singleton representation. So this is a string bit picture, but the string bits are, makes, are made up from these twister fields rather than what people may have thought they would be made up. Okay, so now I'm uh, 
running out of time, so let me just conclude. The free field realization that uh, we have, in some sense, proven for ADS3 cross S3 suggests a natural generalization to ADS5 cross S5. And with some assumptions about the structure of the physical state condition, we reproduce exactly the spectrum of free superhang mills in four dimensions from our world sheet model. And that opens the door towards maybe proving ADS CFT in this context. So there are obviously many, many open, uh, open questions. So in particular, we need to understand this physical state condition from first principles. There are some guesswork at the moment. We would like to understand correlation functions for ADS5. But the structure is so similar, they will behave similar to ADS3. So there'll probably also be delta function localized. So all of this structure will probably go through. We are trying to analyze the perturbation theory away from the free case. You would like to see the Youngian from this world sheet description and so on and so on and so on. So I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Questions from the audience or from uh, internet, online? Okay, Didina. So thank you for, for the very nice talk. Uh, can you say something about uh, the third part, uh, uh, point on your uh, future directions about the perturbation about uh, uh, away from the free case? Right. So so you can ask what's the what's the what's the field that's going to switch on the coupling constant? That's basically the Lagrangian, and you can identify it on the world sheet. So on the world sheet, it corresponds. So the free part of the, the quadratic part is a certain field that arises in the two cycle in the two spectrally flowed sector and the cubic term from the three cycle sector. So we can identify them. And then the idea is that we calculate two point functions of some operator with the insertion of this perturbing field. We calculate this on the world sheet. And what you would like to see is that the anomal that you acquire anomalous dimensions. And uh, given the fact that this smells like uh, it's just trying to mimic uh, a spin chain, what you would hope is that this uh, world sheet calculation would de facto reduce to a spin chain calculation. And you would just see that you are redoing the old spin chain analysis, but uh, now derived from a world sheet perspective. So this is something I'm looking at uh, with Alessandro at the moment and Andrea. Uh, please. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. So in the computation of the spectral flow, you worked in the Neville Schwartz sector. Is this forced or does it also go through in the Ramond sector? Well, well it's, a good, it's a good point, but actually you see if you apply um, so if you start with the Neve Schwartz sector, so if, if you look at this, uh, so, so, so these are the modes that sort of uh, we, we think of as being, so, so the modes that are non-trivial are these modes. These are basically the modes from the first line in this window and then everybody in the larger window. And if you take W equals to one, then you realize that you see this just becomes zero modes. So in fact, what happens if you apply spectral flow by one unit to the neve schwartz sector, you reproduce the Ramon sector. So the Ramon sector is sort of part of this picture. It's just more convenient to describe everything starting from the neve schwartz sector. Thank you. Other questions? Actually, I had one question. Um, basically, you proved that in the case of ADS3 case and so on, that that model is actually symmetric product of T4. Because that, that if you remember, that was a question whether you have to take moduli space of instant arms or so it, you, you prove this particular right so, so I can consider as a final proof of this well I wouldn't say final proof I mean, there are pro I mean so we have checked the correlation so we have proven that the correlation functions match but we haven't checked for all states we've only checked for the twisted sector ground states the spectrum we have checked uh, completely but I think uh, with, with sufficient much effort you can you can regard this as a proof that this specific world sheet theory reproduces exactly the symmetric orbit world. I should also, if I may, yeah, yeah. I should also say there is, this actually works to arbitrary order in one over n. So, so the, the n dependence of the symmetric orbit fold should correspond to the higher genus contributions on the world sheet because the one over n goes like g string. G string characterizes the higher as, uh, world sheet contributions. And in particular, this, uh, this localization property that, uh, that we describe here is also true irrespective of the genus of the world sheet. So, so what you see is that you reproduce the, the covering map of the corresponding, from the corresponding world sheet of the corresponding genus, and the 1 over n corrections of the symmetric orbifold are 
associated to the genus of the covering surface and therefore come from the genus of the corresponding world tree theory. So this is, in some sense, not just working in the planar th limit, but actually including all perturbative one over n corrections. So this is a world tree theory where I think we are very confident that this is exactly dual to the symmetric orbifold and it does it to all orders in perturbation theory. And no meaning for the level, if, if you want to turn on the level? Uh, then, then all hell, hell breaks loose because... Yeah, I understand. These free fields will not work because... Well, the free fields won't work, but also the, the spectrum is much, much bigger. I mean, the spectrum, you instantly discover that there is... You're basically getting another Liouville direction in, in your... You get basically something that looks like the symmetric orbifold of Liouville times T4. So, so T4 you only get at this tensionless point, and when you switch on the Nevis-Schwartz level, you get something that doesn't look at all like the symmetric orbifold of T4. Uh, questions from online? Uh, did you another question? Maybe Eric has a question. Let, let's, uh, Eric? Yeah, I, I did have a question. I mean, uh, do I understand correctly? You're, you're working with just with uh, an affine target space. I mean, because if you think about it, it looks very much like uh, a twister space. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. That's, that's our intuition, that this is, uh, this is like the, the Berkowitz theory. It looks very much like a twister space. So there is a theory that, that Ed Witten wrote down based on the topological string, where he used the fact that for, um, I think, the twister space relevant for n equals 4 is actually a six-dimensional space. That is, uh, could be the target space of some topological string. Have you looked at that, and do you see any relationship with that? Uh, yeah, I, think, I think this is this is similar to what uh, to the Berkowitz theory, uh, but I think the details are slightly different. I mean, they didn't quite reproduce n equals to four, right? They got this super conf uh, this uh, uh, conformal supergravity modes and stuff. So I think our our theory works slightly differently and. Uh, part of it okay. is that uh, that I think we impose this n equals to four gauge condition, so we kill most of the degrees of freedom, but then we have these spectrally flowed sectors where all the degrees of freedom come from. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, before we thank again Professor Gabriel with this very exciting talk, I mean, I have uh, 10 other questions and I'm sure others have and maybe we discuss after. I want to present you a medal. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, in Olympics, you know, they they put on themselves, yeah, but no. I think that it will be okay if I put on you. Okay, but I mean, I think we can just do <laughs> okay. it like that. Okay, as, as Olympics, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, thank this you. comes with okay. my love. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Mark Meze. Mark, uh, do you hear us? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, do you know how to share the screen? Uh, okay, just one second. Please. Okay, no, it's working. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, I we see. I see it at least. Just that we see all the slides. And we, we are just supposed to see one slide. Oh we we see yeah, yeah, we see all the slides, but it's better if we see only one slide at a time. Yes, okay. Let let me try it again. Sorry. I, I wanted to um, uh, see. Um, just one second. Okay. How about now? Good. Very good. Very good. So, um, our last speaker, uh, string theory and quantum gravity section, is Professor Mark Meze from Simon Center of Geometry and Physics. Um, uh, Mark has been working on a variety of things related to the modern uh, things uh, about quantum gravity, about the uh, conformal field theory, basically uh, all kind of modern stuff. Uh, today's talk will be about the volume of black hole interior at day times. Uh, will be fascinating to see what is the vo volume of the black hole interior. Thank you. Please. Thank you. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak at this very exciting Congress. Uh, so this talk will be based on, on a paper that appeared a couple of weeks ago with Luca Iliasiu and Gabo Sharoshi. So let me start uh, by putting my work in a broader context. Uh, so in recent years, there has been uh, um, exciting cross-fertilization between uh, black holes 
uh, and chaotic quantum systems within the framework of the ADS-CFT correspondence. And the particularly fruitful endeavor uh, is to try to identify ubiquitous features in the gravitational description and then try to understand what they mean for the dual field theory. Uh, so one generic behavior of gravity in ADS spacetime is that generic initial conditions, uh, you can see a sketch uh, of the, the Penrose diagram of the following process uh, on the right-hand side, uh, lead to a formation of black hole. So uh, this left-hand side vertical line uh, is the asymptotic ADS boundary. The right-hand line is the origin of polar coordinates. So we are working in global ADS where the conformal boundary is a sphere times time. And uh, this dashed uh, gray line is an uh, initial Cauchy slice. I prepare some uh, matter configuration on this slice and then evolve. Uh, the matter collapses towards the middle uh, of ADS and forms a black hole. The horizon is indicated by this um, dashed gray line and the red line is the singularity. And this process of black hole formation corresponds to thermalization in the dual quantum system. And this initial condition that we prepared corresponds to an initial pure state in the CFD. Once we establish this connection, we can ask about more detailed features of, of black holes. Um, and one hallmark of black hole space times is that their interior uh, grows with time, uh, which we can probe with maximal volume slices. Uh, these are these blue lines uh, through the Penrose diagram. They are anchored at different time points uh, in the boundary. And uh, while Penrose diagrams are not great at capturing distances, one can, uh, if you look at the geometry, you can see that the, the, vol the dominant contribution to the volume comes from the behind the horizon region of the black hole. And uh, the time dependence of the volume looks like this. After an initial transient behavior, it becomes linear and grows forever. Um, okay, so it's reasonable to ask what, what corresponds to this growth of volume in the dual field theory, what field theory observable we can probe this process with. One promising candidate is entanglement entropy of geometric subregions in the boundary theory. And uh, so here's the graph. It's promising since it tracks the volume closely for early times, but at some time uh, of order, the system size, it saturates. And this saturation is too early. Uh, we have confidence in the black hole geometry uh, to a lot later time. So now it's appropriate to discuss some time scales uh, that appear naturally in quantum chaos. We already covered the, the two earliest ones. The inverse temperature uh, is the local thermalization time. This is after which uh, you can apply hydrodynamics to describe this system. Uh, and then uh, the system size, the light crossing time, uh, determines when non-local observables, such as entanglement entropy or separated point correlation functions, uh, equilibrate. But recent years uh, has seen the exploration of later time scales. Uh, if I denote by S0, the black hole entropy, then the logarithm of this is the scrambling time. Uh, so in a large engaged theory, this would be scale as log n. Uh, so it would be relatively large compared to these order one uh, quantities. And uh, the scrambling time uh, is, uh, it can be probed with uh, unconventional correlation functions called out of time ordered correlation functions and has uh, and probing physics at these time scales has really contributed to our modern understanding of quantum chaos. And even more recently, people have been exploring later time scales, the entropy time, which is exponentially larger than the scrambling time, and finally, the uh, Heisenberg time, which is e to the s naught. You should think of Heisenberg time as basically when or any reasonable time evolution stops. By this time, uh, the state has become uh, completely random, uh, but, but obeying the constraints of energy conservation. Okay, so uh, we are wondering uh, to what times should we trust this calculation of the volume, and is there a quantity in the field theory that naturally captures uh, this volume growth? And this uh, prompted Susskind and then later Susskind with collaborators to propose 
uh, that uh, some un unconventional object, the computational or circuit complexity of the evolving wave function is what captures this volume growth. So what is the complexity? It's uh, best talked about in a discrete setting. So let's just imagine a spin chain. Uh, and we want to uh, uh, determine uh, how complex uh, this state that we evolved from a simple state by a long time evolution uh, is. So the way we do this is we start from a simple reference state in the spin chain context. It would maybe be a product state. And we pick a, a set of simple quantum gates that you can use in your quantum computation. And also uh, a small error, Tor alerts. And then we ask, what is the minimal size of quantum circuit uh, that can be used to obtain this state psi of t uh, from the initial reference state using the uh, allowed set of gates? And if we compute, if we construct this minimal circuit, the number of gates that we use is what gives us complexity. Now, I know that this is not a continuum definition, but for our purposes, this rough intuition will be enough. And uh, this is extremely hard to compute in practice, but, uh, but Saskin and collaborators have conjectured that uh, the complexity in a chaotic system uh, will evolve linearly, just like the volume, but at the Heisenberg time, e to the S naught, it will saturate um, to a constant plateau value. And the recent exciting progress in this field is that in a toy model, uh, this recent paper has proven that complexity indeed behaves like this. So this is just some inspiration for us to ask, uh, is there a quantum gravity effect that kicks in at these very late times and that halts the growth of the volume? Uh, so after this introduction, uh, I can show you the outline of my talk. I will be studying this question in a very simple toy model in two-dimensional jacket Teitelbaum gravity. And I will discuss uh, how it's related to uh, wild Peterson volumes of uh, moduli spaces of hyperbolic Riemann surfaces and random matrix theory. Uh, after this uh, technical introduction, uh, we will turn to the computation of the volume in this presentation, uh, and uh, I will end with a summary. Okay, so we want to understand uh, this setup uh, in, in the simplest possible theory, uh, because it looks like a daunting problem. So one step towards simplification is to get rid of matter fields um, and study the problem in pure gravity. Uh, so one way to do that was proposed by Hartmann and Maldacena, uh, who instead of a single uh, collapsing black hole, uh, in a single-sided uh, black hole formed from collapse, uh, studied uh, the time evolution in the eternal black hole. So this is half of the eternal black hole Penrose diagram. I cut it at uh, some, uh, some initial time slice. Uh, and I'm studying the maximal volume slices that bridge, uh, uh, bridge the, through, through the, the Einstein-Rosen bridge in this eternal black hole uh, between the two sides uh, of the eternal black hole. So they are anchored at uh, and both the left and the right boundary. And uh, we evolve both of these points forward in time. And you can see these maximal volume slices look very similar to the maximal volume slices in the uh, single-sided setup. And we understand very well uh, what the dual field theory description of this eternal black hole is. Um, it's the thermofield double pure state uh, of the double uh, holographic dual. And it can be easily prepared uh, using Euclidean path into. So this will be the setup that we study because it's simpler uh, than the single-sided setup. And we thing that it shows the same behavior. Another way of simplifying the problem is to go to lower dimensions. Gravity simplifies as we lower the space number of space-time dimensions. Now, the lowest dimension in which you can still have black holes is two dimensions. Uh, but pure gravity in two dimensions is topological. It's too simple for our purposes. But, we will, but there exist Dilaton gravity theories that we can study and which are uh, non-trivial enough uh, to ask these questions. And one prototypical example is the Jacket-Feitelbaum gravity. 
Um, besides being a toy model, this is also an effective field theory uh, for the near horizon region of near extreme or black holes, um, both in asymptotically fat and uh, ADS spacetimes. And the peculiar property of this effective theory is that it's UV complete on its own. This is unlike uh, most familiar effective field theories like the pion Lagrange. Anyway, so we will be studying this model. It's defined by uh, the, the path integral where we integrate over uh, all metrics and all dilatons. Um, from higher dimensions, it's natural to have a term which is e to the minus s naught times the Euler characteristic of the manifold. And then we have the JT action, which consists of the dilaton multiplying R plus two, plus the Gibbons Hawking boundary term that I'm not writing out. We will analyze this theory in the Euclidean path integral, following closely the presentation of such and Stanford. Um, so one thing we notice is that in this action, phi appears as a Lagrange multiplier, uh, and we can integrate it out. Uh, along an imaginary contouring field space. Uh, and then it imposes a functional delta function. Uh, in, it imposes that at every point uh, in, the, in the space time, R has to be equal to minus two. So we are studying hyperbolic manifolds. Uh, and so the path integral simplifies into a sum over genus uh, times uh, uh, an integral over the uh, boundary fluctuations, boundary gravitons, which are familiar in lower dimensional gravity, and, and an integral over the moduli space of hyperbolic Riemann surfaces. So uh, more concretely, at genus zero, we just get the hyperbolic disk, uh, a cutout version of it. So this is the boundary whose length is fixed to be beta, the inverse temperature, just like in thermal field theory. Uh, so here, in this case, uh, we only we don't have moduli, we only have uh, wiggles, and uh, we can perform this uh, path integral over wiggles. It turns out to be one loop exact, gives us some disk partition function. At higher genus, uh, we can decompose higher genus manifolds in the following manner. Uh, so we have this asymptotic boundary, which is wiggly. Uh, we can cut the manifold at the geodesic of length b. Uh, and then calculate this path integral. It's called, in the, in the literature, it's called the trumpet uh, partition function. It's uh, characterized by the asymptotic uh, boundary length and uh, this geodesic boundary length. And then we are left with um, a bordered Riemann surface. Uh, and we, from this modulized space integral, we get the vol Pyle Peterson volume of this modulized space. And then we have to glue these two together with a measure uh, that one can derive, uh, which is BDB. And then we finally weigh things uh, by this Euler characteristic. So this is the all genus partition function of this theory. Okay, this is pretty concrete, uh, but we can go further. Uh, the famous result of Mirzakani is that uh, there exists a recursion relation for this Wild Peterson volumes. Uh, which are extremely hard to calculate uh, uh, if, if we just work concretely. Um, and uh, Einard and Orantan uh, realized that this recursion relation of Mirzakani is actually an example of some more general uh, recursion relations called topological recursion in mathematics. In physics language, uh, these, these are loop equations in random matrix theory. And such Schenker and Stanford put all these together uh, in this context and showed that this partition function of JT gravity is equal to uh, the following observable in random matrix theory. So we integrate over all matrices H. It should be regarded as some random Hamiltonian. And the measure on these matrices is a, is a potential e to the minus trace V of H. And because we are calculating uh, the thermal partition function, we insert into this matrix six integral trace e to the minus beta h. So we're calculating the average of this trace e to the minus beta h, uh, or the expectation value of this quantity in this matrix ensemble. And this is uh, this agrees to all orders in the genus expansion with uh, with this 
expression that we derived from gravity. Okay, so what we learned from this part of the talk is that JT gravity can be represented as a random matrix integral. And I forgot to say that we further have to apply a double scaling limit, uh, which means that we go with the size of the matrices to infinity, at the same time, uh, scale the energy towards the edge of the spectrum, so that in the end, we get a finite density of states. Okay. So uh, the next part of the talk, we'll talk about the volume again. So it's a natural question that if JT gravity is a random matrix theory, then how do we represent the volume in this random matrix theory? What observable in this random matrix integral uh, computes the volume? So in the previous slides, we were studying Euclidean quantum gravity. So it's uh, uh, fruitful uh, to translate our question into the Euclidean setup, and we can easily do that. I told you that uh, the thermofield double uh, can be prepared with a Euclidean path integral consisting of uh, Euclidean evolution of, uh, of extent beta over two. And uh, so here's, here's this cutout shape on the Poincaré disk, and uh, we anchor uh, the geodesic on, on this uh, cutout shape at two points, and then we compute the length of this geodesic. So one thing I didn't say that in 2D, the volume becomes a length, okay? So this computation at genus zero was done by Zhen Bin Yang. Uh, like, let me explain in pictures how this goes. So we cut open the Euclidean path integral uh, and one can compute an explicit simpler expression for this wave function uh, in the L basis, in the geodesic length basis. So here I wrote the wave function uh, and so we have a bra and a cat. So we get the absolute value squared of Z. And then uh, to calculate the expectation value of L, we simply multiply L with the probability density of L. And there's a non-trivial measure E to the L dL, uh, which I'm not deriving for you. And this gives the expectation value. Now, how do we go from uh, Euclidean to Lorentzian? We simply analytically continue the length of this boundary from beta over two to beta over two plus it. So this is the formula I wrote here. If we evaluate this formula for times a lot larger than beta, anyways, we are interested in late times, then we get the same linear growth we got from the classical theory, except for its coefficient is renormalized a bit. Uh, and uh, there's an e to the s naught prefactor. So what we learned from this computation is that Perturbative gravity, even though we went to all loops in perturbative gravity, is insensitive to the Heisenberg time e to the s naught, and we need uh, non-perturbative effects. We need to go to higher genes. So this is what we did in this work. So how do we do that? Uh, we take this bra and cat and somehow want to make this picture higher genus. So we cut, all, cut a, a disk out of both of these uh, and so we get these pictures. Uh, the geodesic boundaries uh, are, B1, uh, are le of length B1 and B2. And then we glue uh, some higher genus uh, border Riemann surface in here. It can either be connected between the bra and the cat, or they can be disconnected, uh, in which case I would draw something some slightly different. So, uh, this is a somewhat unwieldy expression, but it's very easy to understand each term in it. So e to the L dL times L was what we saw in the previous computation as well. This is just how we co compute the expectation value of L. Then there are these gluing measures between these trumpets and the, uh, and the Riemann surface. Uh, these trumpets come with a wave function, uh, which uh, it depends on three data, the length of the weekly boundary, the length of the geodesic boundary, which will be glued together, and finally, the length of this other geodesic boundary, which is uh, a closed geodesic. And uh, on this side, we get the volume uh, of the moduli space of uh, a Riemann surface with two boundaries of length B1 and B2. And uh, besides this connected contribution, we can also get lots of disconnected contributions, and we have to sum over all that. 
so this is the contribution of, of uh, higher genus Riemann surfaces to this uh, expectation value. And if we compare this uh, to the partition function of uh, two boundaries, uh, where, where the only change we have to make uh, is, the, is to replace these trumpet wave functions with trumpet par partition functions and get rid of the L integral, then we can see that the same uh, combination of volumes of moduli spaces appears in this integral. And massaging this a little bit and reminding ourselves that the partition function is the Laplace transform uh, of the spectral density, or in more physics terms, the density of states weighted by the Boltzmann factor gives us the partition function. We get the final formula that we uh, wanted to get uh, is that um, the expectation value of the length is equal to uh, an integral transform of the spectral two-point function uh, for energies whose mean is E and whose energy difference is omega. Uh, an important feature of this formula is that uh, there's a one over omega squared contribution. Uh, there's also a somewhat unimportant density of states in the uh, denominator. And the whole thing is weighted by a Boltzmann factor and the time dependence comes from this one minus cosine omega t uh, factor. This expression is only true for t a lot, a lot greater than beta. Uh, there's a similar expression for earlier times, uh, but I didn't want to uh, clutter the slides with that. Uh, one further thing we will need is that the density of states uh, takes this form. So it's large. In e to order e to the s naught. And uh, there's this uh, famous cinch square root of e formula that you may have seen in, uh, in other talks. Uh, and this is the leading uh, density of states and there are higher genus corrections to it. Okay, so we, with all this preparation, we want to compute what this expectation value actually is. Uh, and the uh, and the very profound result in random matrix theory comes to the rescue. Uh, it turns out that universally for omega, so energy differences, which are of order mean level, inverse mean level spacing, um, sorry, which are order, uh, inverse, which are order of the level spacing, uh, which in our case, since the density of states was large, e to the s naught is order e to the minus s naught. Uh, irrespective of what the matrix potential is in the random matrix theory, um, the uh, density two-point function uh, takes a universal form. It has a disconnected contribution, rho e squared, uh, minus the so-called sine, sine kernel squared. Um, these come in the two-boundary partition function from two very different contributions. The disconnected piece comes from the case when the two boundaries don't talk to each other. So we simply get uh, two disconnected space times. The denominator of this expression comes from uh, the case when we have a wormhole connecting the two boundaries. But the numerator of it uh, is not coming from any geometry. It's coming from a resummation effect of all geometries. If we write out the sign as the sum of exponentials, uh, then it's e to the i e to the s naught, since rho v is e to the s naught times omega. So it's doubly non-perturbative. We cannot see it in the geometric description, but we can see it in, but it's a fundamental result in random matrix theory that for all random matrix integrals, we get, get this contribution. And the, both the denominator and the numerator will be important in the calculation I present. So can we use this universal formula? Precisely at the time scales that we are interested in, uh, we can, since omega is conjugate to t, and uh, we want to go to time scales of order e to the s naught. This is exactly the uh, omegas for which we can use this formula. Mark five so, minutes. Five minutes. Okay, uh, I'm soon wrapping up. Uh, so let us uh, compute uh, now this double integral. Uh, we already saw what the disconnected contribution gives. Uh, this is the genus zero answer and it gives a forever growing contribution. How about uh, this green guy? 
Now, it's easy to see that at early times it would give a very small contribution. This thing is e to the 2s not big, whereas this thing for omega of order one is uh, order one. So it's, uh, it's uh, so the, the, or the purple curve is uh, enhanced by two powers of e to the s naught compared to the green one, at least at early times. But if we go uh, with times of to order s naught, so omega of order e to the minus s naught, then uh, this thing uh, will be equally big as this thing. And if we do the integral, what we find indeed is that it's small until this time, and then it starts to grow linearly with a negative slope. It doesn't just grow linearly with a negative slope. The slope exactly agrees with the slope uh, of the purple curve. So if we add up the two contributions magically, uh, we get this curve. And this is the curve that I sketched for complexity. So we find that these non-perturbative effects uh, yield the following result. The volume of the black hole interior in this simple model uh, behaves just like we expect complexity to behave. So let me summarize. We started from this connection between gravity and the quantum field theory within the ADS-CFT correspondence. And we saw that in gravity, black hole interiors grow generically. And we asked, what does it correspond to in QFT? And there was a proposal in the literature that it corresponds to complexity growth. This is all well, uh, but complexity stops growing at the Heisenberg time, uh, whereas the classical black hole interior grows forever. So we asked if there are any quantum gravity effects that halt the growth. Uh, we found that indeed there are non-perturbative effects. So we asked uh, what these are, and we saw that the volume stops growing due to doubly non-perturbative effects, which, was, which were only visible in the matrix model description of this system. So what lesson do we learn uh, from, for QFT or quantum systems? We learn that this object that is studied in the literature, this holographic complexity, is actually a spectral complexity. It only depends on the spectrum of the theory, on the spectral two-point function. And even though we derived uh, it in a matrix ensemble in this JT gravity theory, we can also write down a formula for the spectral complexity in any chaotic system. So if we write down this formula, uh, it's a double sum over uh, the spectrum. Uh, there's the Boltzmann weighting of the average energy, this one over energy difference squared. This was the one over omega squared in, in our formula times one minus cosine of the energy difference times time. Then uh, if we take the, the ensemble average of this formula, then we get the, the formula I work with, but this can be evaluated in any chaotic quantum system. And I will end with showing you uh, how it looks in, in a chaotic quantum system. Actually, we took uh, the SYK model and uh, averaged over 90 realizations to get a smooth curve. I and mean, we see the same kind of behavior that we saw in gravity. So linear growth and then saturation. This is a log log plot. The inset shows a linear plot uh, with the initial um, quadratic growth. Um, and so I would like to end by thanking you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, Questions from the audience or online? Anton? Um, hi, thank you for a nice talk. So you, you've shown us an example of this volume which saturates at the time e to the power s naught, but then in the beginning you also listed other characteristic times. Can mm -hmm. you gauge observables to saturate at other times? So is there some understanding, suppose, I give you an observable, can you predict at which time it uh, will saturate? It, it's kind of, can one in some way classify vi vi which observable falls to which time scale? Thank you. That's a very good question. So I don't know a method to, to just by you give me an observable and then I write away answer at what time uh, does it saturate, but we know of some examples. So. Uh, uh, we saw that, so one point functions saturate at time beta, non-local observables. So if my field theory is uh, in compact space of length L, 
then the biggest known locality I can introduce is of order L, and they will, they will saturate at uh, times of order L. So these are time-ordered correlation functions, Wilson loop expectation values, entanglement entropy. Uh, the scrambling time uh, is, uh, is not visible in simple observables, but can be probed with out-of-time-ordered correlation functions. They saturate at this time scale. I do not know of anything that saturates at, 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 at S0, uh, but maybe that's just my ignorance. And then I would say that anything uh, that one can reasonably come up with will saturate uh, at e to the S0, because by this time the state is random for all intents and purposes. Uh, so any observable that, that you can, I mean, that I can think of will, will saturate at this time. But I, I should mention that there's also this extremely long time scale, the Poincare time scale of Poincare recurrences, which are e to the e to the s naught. I do not know anything how to probe this time scale, but maybe in the future people will figure out. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, I have one simple question, Mark. Uh, actually, um, I probably missed during the lecture. If I look on the first term, I mean, you had this expansion um, of Saad, Schenker, and uh, Stanford. Uh, first term is a disk one. Uh, you explained what this complexity is already for the first term, but th that first term is given by Schwarzian path integral, right? Schwarzian path integral it gives me the wiggles uh, on the boundary. So the Schwarzian, like. So disk, um, disk part would be uh, the, the Schwarzian coming from Schwarzian, right? Well, the, I mean, basically, the trumpet is also computed by a twisted Schwarzian path integral. So, so the good, in general, good, good. in JT gravity, the, all these the orange wiggles are captured by Schwarzian modes, right. and the rest is only integration over moduli spaces right. of high. Good, good. So, complexity. What do I have to take for the diffeomorphism element? What 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 do I'm averaging with Schwarzian to get the complexity? Uh, well, you. You have to sum over all, so it's it's not one, it's a sum of objects in Schwarzian. So you have to combine the Schwarzian path integrals with volumes of... Uh, I understand, of but, okay. we, we can't write it as some kind of path integral. Yes, we cannot uh, write it in, yeah. And uh, did, did, did anyone, did you try, someone tried to kind of come up with um, kind of path integrals that reproduces the expansion, except mm. going back to the JT gravity, some other one. No, 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 but like, I mean, this is, this is good enough for our purposes. So okay. uh, we, yeah, we start, we use the Schwarzian as a building block, but then the more fundamental description uh, seems to be this random matrix theory. Okay. And then we just so basically use- basically random matrix theory is postulated based on the result of the um, sad um, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Other questions online, maybe, Elise? No? Yes, uh, I have a question. I mean, you talked about these doubly non perturbative effects. Uh, I mean, they're not really uh, calculated in, in using the gravity formulation. You use the random matrix uh, formulation. Uh, but the effect you see is sort of similar to what we'll see in the plateau of the spectral form factor. And there people talk about uh, half wormholes and things like this as sort of in order to get some uh, idea of what might be a, a gravitational kind of set hole that would be corresponding to this. So you have any ideas about what, what you would have to do, do in the gravity side or is there some settle in the gravity theory that could explain these effects? Yeah, that's a, a excellent, ex excellent. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. So, so indeed the spectral form, so there are important similarities and differences compared to the spectral form factor. So let me try to explain that a little bit. So indeed, the spectral form factor is also a double integral of transform of this quantity, the spectral two-point function. Uh, the only major difference between the two quantities is that in the spectral form factor, you don't have this one over omega squared. And that leads to uh, quite dramatic differences. So. Uh, whereas in the spectral form factor, the whole curve, both the ramp and the plateau, comes from this uh, green piece, and the, the disconnected piece uh, is basically only interesting at early times, and at these late times, it just basically decayed 
uh, with the power law to zero and we can throw it out. Here, we get the competition between the two terms. But back to Eric's question. So indeed, uh, the, in, in this work of Satshanker Stanford, uh, they, they try to uh, understand these non doubly non-perturbative effects uh, as, as coming from deep brains. Uh, and so since we are working with the same quantity, um, it, it will apply here as well. So whatever explanation they came up is equally applicable here. But I, we are not so comfortable with, with, with that description. In particular, we don't really understand how, if we have these space, these, uh, these brains, we didn't really understand how to talk about the, the length, whether it can end on these deep brains or, or what contribution comes. So we rather just worked all, or, all orders in the genus expansion and then said, okay, now this agrees with random matrix theory, let us use the random matrix theory language. Okay, excellent, thank you. So, sorry, if I may follow up. So once you postulate random matrix theories and all this interpretation kind of, it disappears, right? You, you, you say that this is my definition, I'm calculating and you, you get just a formula. So I, that's I, a I, that's a true criticism of, of yeah. so we don't so, have a very good picture of of what's happening. I mean, one okay. So one 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 kind of word that we can say, or like one kind of thing that we can say, is that whereas in this picture uh, this um, length of the interior is growing forever, here what can happen is that even though this is growing we get other contributions from these higher genus surfaces where this L remains uh, very small and uh, only this part of the space time is growing. Uh, so the volume of, uh, of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So somehow we can, yeah, the, it, the, this uh, distance between the two endpoints can shorten from, from gravitational yeah. instant. But the, yeah, these are the words. Uh, it's not the, so Saad, or when in the study of two-point functions, uh, has uh, has very nice discussions about uh, a space-time picture of, of what's going on. Uh, yeah, but we the attitude we took is that we calculate and then we find a okay, more a, I, I, fundamental. I, 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 okay, uh, let's thank Mark again for for a great talk. Thank you so much. Uh, since this was thank the last you. talk, uh, I want to also to thank. Uh, First of all, my co-organizer, Eric Verlinde, who is somewhere here. Uh, thank you, Eric, for helping in organizing the string theory section. Um, and of course, I want to thank uh, organizers of the Congress. Uh, Anton is here. Thank you, Anton. And Elise, and ev everybody who contributed to, to have this uh, section of string theory on the Congress. And Eric and I tried to make it as a uh, uh, as broad as possible, uh, so we, we ended up with pretty much pretty different talks. So I, I, I would say that uh, this was uh, interesting and successful due to basically our speakers uh, who did main contribution. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> we can turn it off now.